welcome to everyone from southwest France, where it's about one degree. It's very cold and, and rainy today. Um, but uh, we've all we're all got warm hearts, and so that really doesn't matter. And I'm going to start by uh, lighting the candle, and then we're going to have. <coughs> I can get this to work. So here we are in the sacred space, and I'm then uh, we're going to play a, a short piece of music. Um, and then uh, a peeler will open our meeting with uh, with an invocation. Brilliant. Okay, I'll just mute everyone. Here we go. Thank you. And I see Apila has a sage there. Well, you'll need to unmute Apila. Ancestors of all assembled here, unseen yet presenced. We welcome you to this virtual fire, this council of people drawn through logic, through passion, to the circle this morning, this evening, this afternoon. All over the world we come together now, aware of the great peril evidenced in the collapse of our ecosystems of a pandemic and of fear racing around the world through social media, through news feeds. What is true? And how do we find that truth without a common language and set of symbols? For these reasons and many more, for the love we carry in our heart, for the creative process, for life, we join hands now virtually. Let this talk, the sharing of feelings, of intellect, be creative and productive. Let this dance with uncertainty spin us into a passionate dance of life. In concert with each other, we rise. Ah, Mama, Ua, Noah. Thank you. Amen.
Thank you so much, Apila. Uh, it just feels so different convening in this way, <clears throat> so that we across the the planet we can come together in this virtual space, uh, even if we can't be in a circle. We're in a kind of virtual circle. So, um, just to give you an outline of the evening, we're, we're going to talk in the first half of, uh, between L Leroy and uh, Apila and myself. Um, I'm going to be asking the questions mainly or some questions. Then we're going to go into uh, breakout rooms for 10 minutes just before the break, probably about 8.50, 8.55, um, if that's, that's the right time for London, depending on what time zone you're in, of course. This is the widest time zone of any webinar we put together. And, and uh, then we're going to come back. Um, Andrew and I are going to tell you a little bit about the network for those of you who are new. And then we're going to have some questions and answers discussion um, to see what we can, uh, what comes up in, in this, this council that we're, as it were, holding um, this evening. So I'm, I'm going to, to ask um, both Apila and Leroy to say a little bit about their work and, and their path and where they are and where they've come from. And Leroy, I, I, I'd like to ask you also to mention in this context a little bit of your connection with David Bohm. Um, but I'm going to start with Appealer, if I may, and then we'll come on to Appealer, and then I'll, I'll, we'll go on to the first um, main question. Appealer. Yes. Good morning. Aloha from the Hawaiian Islands. So I'll be here talking with you and hearing from you from the middle of the Pacific. I live on the most remote landmass of the planet. Um, I'm an Oneata Aga. I'm an Oneida American Indian. And I am also uh, nearly half Gaul. So <clears throat> I grew up in two worlds, French and Indian. My grandfather spoke French in Oneida, um, and he was the person that was closest to me. I grew up in a time that doesn't exist anymore in the United States. And as Leroy taught me years ago, time is place over there. So, the over there that I grew up in was a time where there was no television, no radio. I grew up in a uh, basically a two room house with my brother and sisters, mother and father, and extended family down the road. I grew up in a wilderness, um, a northern forest, and at night I, in the winter, I could hear the blowing snow, moonlight shimmering crystal refracting diamonds, just beautiful blue-white diamonds frosting the snow. And in that cold north wind time, I could hear the howl of the wolves. When we got our water, we would go to the stream. And in the winter, we had to break the ice in order to get the water and bring it home to drink. When I got up in the morning, we would have to break the ice off the top of the bucket to have a drink, to have water, to brush our teeth, wash our faces. Um, it was a time of kerosene lights, and it was a time of stillness. That time, when I look back on it, I didn't know how precious it would be living that close to the earth. I didn't know that it would go away. I didn't know that the beautiful forest that was around me would be clear cut. I witnessed many, many things, many changes in our lives. And when I was in high school, my family um, moved to a big city in Wisconsin because I'm a Wisconsin Oneida. Oneata Aga means people of the everlasting stone. Uh, and on the French side, my grandfather's name Merle is a particular type of blackbird with a lovely song in France. I was very close to my grandfather, and he taught me my indigenous roots. I cannot say that he taught me um, the deep ceremonial life that Leroy was so blessed to be able to grow up in, because my people, the Iroquois Confederacy, met the invading Europeans, and yes, French, half of me, uh, 500 years ago. So our culture... Um, had contact and had 
invasion, suffered invasion for a very long time. And my particular group of Oneida people were relocated to the state of Wisconsin, what is the state of Wisconsin in the 1820s. And with that move, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, Eliezer Williams, a man who was both Christian and um, uh, half English that took us to Wisconsin and situated us on la the lands of people that we had been, my people had been hostile to. Um, and with that move in about 100 years, 120 years, we had lost almost everything. There are maybe 13 speakers of the language. People had been really missionized. Um, and we had two things. We had churches and we had bars and neither of them filled that deep emptiness inside. So in my generation, we um, mobilized. It was a time of the civil rights movement. And I was at the headquarters in Milwaukee, Wisconsin of the American Indian movement. I was also um, in university because before my grandfather died, he was holding me on his lap and he announced to my big extended family at a family gathering, when Apila grows up, she's going to go to university. And none of us even, well, maybe my mom and dad might have heard of a university, but we'd never seen one. We didn't know what happened there, but um, my family really believed in education. And um, at the time, it was, I, I'm the first generation in Leroy too, really, where it became possible for American Indians to get advanced degrees. Be, before that time, there were maybe uh, no more than a dozen American Indians, Alfonso Ortiz, uh, Darcy McNichol, um, Eastman, a few others that got PhDs. Then uh, I was privileged to know some of them. So when I, um, when I graduated high school, I entered university and um, it was a disaster, really. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, but I muddled my way through and eventually uh, got a PhD, ended up getting a PhD at Brandeis and at Harvard Universities. I studied at both universities, but my degree in social policy actually came from Brandeis. Um, but my background in federal Indian law and uh, Indian child welfare and so forth, that came from Harvard. So I had a really mixed life when I was in, in Boston going to school. It just happened that universities were bringing American Indians. There are, there are over 200 universities and colleges in the Boston, in the greater Boston area. And at that time in the um, American Indian movement, it was popular for universities on the East Coast to, to bring indigenous medicine men um, to speak. And it really was interesting and strange that my first sweat lodge experience was uh, in, a, in a rural area outside of Cambridge where um, John Fire Lame Deer had built a sweat lodge. So <laughs> my first sweat lodge was there. And as much as my mind was uh, just forced through old school uh, patriarchal neo-colonial processes of a PhD program at the time, I was also being supported by the appearance of these uh, medicine men and women that were coming from Western United States whose cultures were far more intact than my own. Um, so it was really... Um, uh, it, a bivalent experience, um, and it was quite torturous, actually, in some ways, at least for my mind. But the sweat lodge, the pipe ceremonies, and things that I could go to, uh, really, really helped me. Um, one thing is that uh, when I started my doctoral program, um, I wasn't, of course, born in wealth, and most of the students that I was in my doctoral program with were very wealthy, and I really couldn't compete. I didn't, I didn't think the way that peop, other people thought, and I didn't have a support, support group. So I, got, I became really stuck. I had a 
Brandeis was a wonderful university in a sense that it's a Jewish university. Albert Einstein was one of the founders. And um, there were many of my professors who had experiences with the Holocaust. And because of that, they were very kind and supportive and, and they really wanted to see me succeed. But I got stuck for over a year. And why I got stuck is my committee asked me to give them an outline of my next six chapters and for one full year, I couldn't do it. So I finally went home to Wisconsin, drove 1,500 miles on an old beat up car on an icy road, and went home for a peyote ceremony. After that ceremony, the medicine man told me, Rufus Killscrow Indian said, when you get back to Boston, you need to go to a tree and make an offering and ask for help. And I did that. But I have to admit, at the time, I felt crazy about doing it. I said, wow, if somebody sees me talking to this tree. So, um, and then the next thing that happened, it was like, <laughs> the just touch. I started writing poetry, and it was published all over in American Indian journals and newspapers. And I thought, well, it, like King, just like I'd asked, <laughs> I'd gotten the gold, but maybe I should have said I want to write only for a dissertation purpose. And one day, in desperation, like, why can't I get unstuck? I lined out the paper, the poetry that had been published, and there was the outline for my PhD. With it, though, came the question and the insight, like, why was I so stuck? And the answer came, because we have a science of our own. When I realized that, it was, of course. And then I got excited. I got empty manila folders because no computers in those days. Empty manila folders. And I said, okay, if we've got a science, we've got philosophy and we've got terms. And we, I organized all these folders. And then I looked at them and I started to cry because I realized I didn't know what went into any of them. That's how thorough the colonization was for Oneida people. And also, personally, for me, being a half-half French, half-Indian person, my dissociation from my heritage on both sides. So realizing that there was an American Indian science, um, I talked to my advisors, and what they said to me, the reconciliation was, well, write, any, write an outline for six chapters, anything you want to satisfy the requirement, and we won't hold you to it. So that's how it got resolved. Um, and as I wrote it in my, as I, as I used the term indigenous science in my 1982 dissertation, I became known by my own people as the mother of indigenous science. <laughs> not, that, not that I had, knew what indigenous science was completely, but simply that I had coined the term and devoted my life to it. So I think that brings me up to date, except for this. In the um, mid-late 80s, I was teaching at the University of Calgary in Alberta, and there I met Amethyst First Rider and Leroy Little Bear. And <clears throat> I had this idea, I had this dream. I wanted to form um, a group dedicated to bringing out this indigenous science and interfacing with Western science. And Leroy, and Amethyst, his wife, helped me do that. So in 1989, we convened uh, a meeting uh, at Nakota Lodge in uh, just, oops, sorry. Why didn't you know it? I forgot to turn off my cell phone. So we convened this meeting at Nakota Lodge out in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. We had about 30 participants or more. There were healers from different parts, medicine men, cultural practitioners from different parts of the world. We had scientists there, and we talked about bringing these two worlds together. And from that came the Worldwide Indigenous Science Network, which I'm the president founder of, and whose headquarters I'm in right now, and welcoming you. And um, the I'll get into more of what we did, yeah. what organization is that I think has spoken long enough. Yeah. 
<laughs> the <Very fine>. life. <laughs> Thank you very much, Abila. So we'll pass it over to Leroy. It's a nice segue um, that you just mentioned how he was involved. So Leroy, tell us a bit about your, your work and, and your path. Thanks very much. And hey, what the people are talking about really brings back good memory. Um, I was born and raised on the Blood Indian Reserve, and I won't get into the history about reservations and so on, uh, but they were part of the colonization practices of British people and <laughs> Europeans in general when they came to the Americas. Just very briefly, the whole notion was that, hey, you know, there's a whole bunch of natural resources and so on in this new land that we found, that is the Americas. But there are some people there already, and we need to get them out of the way. So that's mm -hmm. how reservations came to be. Yeah. <clears throat> so I was born on a reserve and on a reservation, grew up there, and as part of that reservation uh, and colonization, uh, I went to what they called residential schools and so on uh, on the uh, <clears throat> on the res. Went all in fact went through high school through the uh, the reserve residential school after it. After the residential school, after my residential school experience, I uh, <clears throat> I said, "Oh, you know, I've had enough education. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go wander around a little bit in the world." I found myself up on in the west coast of the United States, Washington, down towards California, and so on. And before the you know what, I was doing little odd jobs here and there, you know, to stay alive. And I was working in a cannery one time. And I, you know, I was running this machine in the cannery doing vegetables. I think in this particular case, we were doing asparagus. And one day, I don't know how a trained monkey feels, but I just, I just saw myself, you know, at like a trained monkey. And because I was so part of the machine and so on. In fact, I, my mind can be on the moon. I, you know, was just part of the machine. And, but one day it struck me about being a trained monkey. And I said, that's it. I'm going to go back to school. And just as time goes, my mom had, in fact, had called me uh, shortly after that. And he, she said, hey, they've started a brand new university at home right next door to the uh, to our reservation why don't you come home and go to school and you know coming back to the notion of the trained monkey i said that's it i called up the foreman not the foreman the he was a service guy supervisor and i told him come over here he came over and i told him hey I want you to get somebody to uh, run this machine because I'm walking off. I'm done. He kind of smiled and I said, no, no, I mean it. I'm going to walk off. Go get somebody to, to run the machine. And he finally believed me. He did get somebody to run the machine and I walked off. And that was the start of my, you know, wanting to get higher education. Now, 
while I was still going to an almost finished high school, I grew up alongside, you know, my parents, of course, and but I grew up alongside some very, you know, intelligent and elders with wisdom and so on. And one of them was my uncle. And one day he told me, I want you to go to school because if you go to school, you will get paid for your thoughts. You know? <laughs> Not like me. Everything is that, you know, I sweat at the brow and breaking on my back and so on. But if you go to school, you'll get paid for your thoughts. And I never forgot that. But he also told me, but when you do go to school, I don't want you to forget your people. I want you to go to school for your people. See? And so I did start university, finished the university, and mm -hmm. I off, off I went to law school, graduated from law school at the University of Utah, and came back and started what a pal knew and was talking about at the University of Lethbridge, a very brand new university. We started uh, Native American Studies. And I've been with the University of Lethbridge ever since we opened our doors in 1975. And except for two years where we did a stint at Harvard University to to set up their program and so forth, and taught a few classes there at Harvard. I've been with the University of Lethbridge. And all along, science from high school had always been my interest. I veered off into law, but law didn't do it, quite do it, and so on. So most of my life, has been revolving around the notion of indigenous science. So, you know, very speeding up of the video and clipping little bits and pieces of here, you know, you have an idea of my background. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> uh, Leroy. Uh, so what I'd like to move on to now is your thoughts on how indigenous science differs from Western science. It's something we talked a little bit about um, when <clears throat> we had our conversation a few weeks ago. Uh, so who'd, who'd like to um, start on that one? Mm. Leroy, you want to pick that up, please? Oh, I'll be glad to. <clears throat> what I've been telling audiences as of late is that you have to you have to do a little bit of research, a little bit of going back. And what I've been telling my audiences has been that if you go way back, how a society comes into existence, and however they come into existence, you might want to ask John Locke or Rousseau about how societies come together. But once a society you know, starts to come together, they sooner or later claim a territory. And within that territory, they have a mutual relationship with the totality of the territory. The sky, you know, the cosmos, the plants, the animals, and so on. And it's through this mutual relationship that thinking processes, if you want to call them paradigms, if you want to call them metaphysics, develop. And customs and practices, you know, develop. Social values develop. Okay. And so, but... Talking about the metaphysics and the paradigms, those are the ways of thinking and so on that the society more or less 
I don't know if it had at any specific time it occurs, but more or less says to the members of the society, this is how we are going to interpret reality. See, in other words, we, we are, we take in data through our senses and these, these paradigms, these metaphysics, metaphysical basis, that's how we're going to interpret reality, see. And so it's on that basis that science, among other things, is developed. So in Western thought, you know, science to a very large extent, Akila was referring to Brandeis University and one of the founders being Einstein. I used to go and drink with him. You know, hey, I, uh, you know, science, the metaphysics of Western thought is, hey, you, you've got a stagnant world. Remember Einstein? God does not play dice with the universe. See, it's stagnant. Whereas in the Blackfoot world, in the native world, hey, everything is always in motion. Okay. Everything, you know, that in, in the native world, everything is in the flux and always in motion. See, that flux is made up of energy waves as opposed to matter in Western thought. See, Western, in the native world, Everything is animate in Western thought. You know, everything is inanimate except for you and I and those few animals out there, see. In the native world, in the my Blackfoot world, everything is about relationships, see. Whereas over here in the Western world, Ever, we do everything in isolation. We might start out from a broad base, but we narrow down. See, in my Blackfoot world, we always renew things. It's about renewal. See, in a Western world, it's been there, done, did it. Let's move on. See. And that moving on, we call progress, see. And of course, you know, the language I speak mirrors that flux, that motion, my everything being animate and everything being related over here mirrors the inanimate, the things, you know, everything being in isolation and so on, see, makes for a big difference. And so when you come to science, say, hey, we have a very different approach. Say, over here, we treat in the Western world that everything that's out there is inanimate, so I can do anything to it. In my world, it's about all my relations. It's a web of relational networks. And yes, as Apila was saying, I can talk to those trees. They're my relations. Hey, over here, that's a crazy thought to be <laughs> talking to trees. See? Very different approach. So those are the foundational basis of a very different approach to science. I think that's, that's very well put, Leroy. Thank you very much. And it reminds me of Thomas Berry's remark saying that he wanted to move from the world seen as a collection of objects to a communion of subjects. And I think that's what you've been describing as a communion of subjects, a relational 
approach as opposed to an objective measurement approach. Apila, would you like to come in um, with a, a, any further thoughts on that? Yeah, so I wanted to, um, I wanted to acknowledge that right now, uh, what we're talking about is also happening. And when uh, Leroy and I began talking, you notice we go to story form, we go to a narrative, and a narrative has a really good way of expressing truth. Um, the power of a narrative, the power of the circle, if you think about just geometrically a circle, a circle is um, economical and it's conservative. It takes the least, uh, the least surface to contain the most mass and you can't stack it. <laughs> so uh, in accordance with the circle, Leroy and I both are telling our narratives uh, because in a narrative, you see a narrative can can give a narrative gives you the experience of truth along with caring facts that's what traditional stories do uh, but and the other thing is you can't uh, with a story you're not trying to define limit what is true that's another advantage to it um so right now leroy and i are coming in our <laughs> in our indigenous minds and we're on in this virtual platform and we are trying to talk talk we used to say in my time talk indian english right we're trying to talk indigenous science in a western context we're doing that right now right <laughs> and um, the thing is that uh we do a lot in in Indigenous Western Indigenous science is that we are slow to start out. I remember one time hearing Amazonian Indians talk, and I thought, oh my God, we met for something, and the only thing longer than the Amazon was their speech making. And uh, so the thing is, we talk, or we tell a lot of stories. One night I was in a ceremony, and a man stood up and he said, I'd like to say a few, uh, I'd like to share a few thousand words and then I'll say something. And he laughed, you know, and it's like that. We tell stories and at first uh, to a Western audience, it can be disconcerting. It's like, when are they going to get to the point? Right? Well, if Leroy and I succeed with you, David, in the stories that we share, there will be a point. And um, for the indigenous science and mind perspective, um, it's not either or. In holism, mm -hmm. uh, it, f the symbol, a good symbol for it, indigenous science is a square inscribed in a circle. And it's referring to both motion in the universe, the waves that Leroy was talking about, as well as the form or the geometry or the structure. When you put the two together, the Mayans call it hunapku, and it's refer when you say that in English, we would say it's God. So what we're doing today, maybe not so well, maybe well, I don't know, kind of feeling our way through this, um, is we are, we are reaching for our own divinity of uh, wisdom, of science, and of the purity of truth. So thank you. Okay. Could you could you say a little bit about language in that sense? Um, I'm thinking of um, partly of David Bohm, who I mentioned. Yep. A lot of people here are very interested in David Bohm because he tried to invent this new dynamic language of the Rio mode, he called it. And there's been a huge, as you know, interest in this film, Infinite Potential, which has been seen by over half a million people, including a showing that we did. And I, I think David was one of the the scientists who had an intuitive understanding of this dynamism, this movement, this energy, this wholeness that you're talking about. Would yes. You know, we say, um, you see, even in my little, I have my Western geek, my Western science geek notes, prepping myself for this talk today, and I throw them away, right? But I was thinking about friends of mine in, um, in the Altai, you know, right next to Siberia. Um, and the Altai, the Maori 
and like when you heard the chant, that was Maori Timothy Bramley singing in the chant this morning when we opened or opening of this presentation. And um, what we say is that the the wairua, the the wisdom, the knowledge, it's moving. It's all around us. And in the West, we might have a hypothesis and we might test something out or we might have uh, uh, an insight but and we do research. But when we're in ceremony and the wairua or the belim, as the Altai would say, is moving around, we mm -hmm. have skills and protocols that sometimes let us catch it. So it's a really... It's what Leroy says, the knowledge is, it's, uh, it's alive and it's situated in places more strongly, different aspects more strongly. But for sure, if you're going to have luck catching some knowledge or wisdom, ceremony is a great place to be. Mm. Thank you. Leroy, would you like to come in there? And also, you, you knew David Bohm quite well, I think, and had conversations with him and David Pete and various other people. Yes, and those were very interesting conversations. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to language, let me, let me just point out a few big differences between, I'll, I'll use Blackfoot because that's what I grew up with, but I know it to be the same in Anishinaabe and Iroquoian languages and so on. But let me use Blackfoot. I, uh, <clears throat> I, I had used as an example, uh, just to give you a taste of it, and that is, if I say in Blackfoot, I'm going to lay down, I would say, Daxas Tokshts. Daxas Tokshts. And if you told, if you asked the Blackfoot speaker to translate Daxas Tokshts, generally they would say, oh, it means to lay down. But in reality, when you really look deep into the meaning of the words and sounds, really what it means is, I'm going to make myself thin. I'm going to make myself thin. If you stop and think about it, what are the implications? Well, if you go back to the notion about the energy waves as part of the uh, paradigms, hey, if I'm standing up, there's a whole lot more energy waves that are going to be hitting me, so to speak, penetrating my being. Okay, if I lay myself thin, there's a whole lot less that are going to, you know, hit my being, say. Okay. Now, the same thing with imitao, imitao. If you, you know, generally, if you ask the Blackfoot speaker, to translate into English, imitao, they would say that's dog. But it doesn't mean dog at all. What it really means is it is a being of some kind. We don't specify, as Apila was saying, it's a being of some kind on the move, moving. And so that speaks to the nature of the language that, hey, there's no finality because in that flux and that constant motion, things can change forms. We have no problems with transformations, see? Things can change. So it may appear like it does right now, but it can change form, see? And that's why there is no finality to it, 
see. Now, the other thing is, I'll point out a couple more things. The other thing is, when you're, when you're in school, we all want to have, and we're taught vocabulary, okay? And when I'm being taught vocabulary, it's more like I have to try and know as many of the words in the Oxford English Dictionary, okay? Well, the Oxford English Dictionary, I don't know if it has a million words in it today yet. It may have. It may have a million words and so on. But if you're a good English speaker, you would know or should know as many of those words in the dictionary. That's vocabulary. In Blackfoot, we don't worry about that, okay? What we, what we carry around in our minds is similar to the, uh, you know, the periodic table for chemists, see? A good chemist knows how to play around and mix different, you know, elements from that periodic table, okay? Well, a good Blackfoot speaker, it's as though they have a periodic table of primary sounds. So a good Blackfoot speaker knows how to make combinations. So I'm going alongside a happening and I'm simply recording through my language the happening, the event. I never say really this is the way it is, knowing it might change. See? See? I'm just recording what's happening. See? Lastly, one other big difference is, of course, English is very binary, uh, dichotomous, good and bad, saint and sinner, all the, that. You can go down the list. And the boundary between good and evil, let's say, is watertight so that you cannot be good and evil at the same time. You're always either or, see, always either or. And that you know, there's a whole bunch of ramifications that arise out of that, see. And talking about social values and so on, hey, when we talk about black and white, see, well, just think about racism, see, because black is associated with darkness, Darkness is evil, and so on, whereas good, you know, purity, saintliness is associated with white, say, to a very large extent, you know, because of the either-or notions, say. So, those are big major differences in languages. There's a whole lot more I can say about it, but you could begin to see how a language leads you down a garden pathway of thinking. See, so watch what you say. Thank you very much. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in this particular topic, I can recommend Blackfoot Physics um, by David Peat, in which uh, the Leroy plays a, a large part, uh, published about 15 years ago, I think. Um, Coming back to Apila, I'd like to, um, if you're there, Apila, you're, yeah, you're live, good. I'd like to move on to dreaming um, and the voice of the earth and the work you've been doing with the, the, the Ubiquiti Chartres Academy and what, or what you've been noticing that's been coming up, because I think this will be of enormous interest to us, especially after sort of two days after the, um, the full moon. We're in the whole cycle of life. So 
do tell us a little bit about that and also about the Sharks Academy. Yes, um, thank you. So the first thing I want to say is that as Leroy and I have been talking it's from an indigenous perspective, and you know, I said that I half of my ancestry is European. Um, I can remember going to, um, and I, I, I'm coming to the dreams, I promise. <laughs> I can remember going to ceremonies and I would be the only mixed blood or half breed person there. And um, I, I, I knew when my whiteness came in the door with me, I, I knew I made people uncomfortable. Um, and I made them uncomfortable because ceremonies in the United States were, were illegal until 1978. So, when ceremonies were held, they were underground, and here I come. So I was always carrying like the perpetrator and victim under one skin. And what I mentioned that in Oneida that we had lost so much of our culture and our heritage and our ceremonies, and we started um, in the American Indian movement, but it basically was Dorothy Ninham who's just coming out with a new book. I'll, um, I'll get the title of it about, it's a history of the American Indian movement, but essentially uh, no one would, the men didn't listen to us at the time when we said we wanted to get like our ceremonies and our culture back. And it ended up being Dorothy and her kids and my children in an attic, room upstairs in the city of Milwaukee uh, with this old Sioux medicine man. And we had to go shopping to tribes next door to us because we'd been relocated for help. And the Sioux who had at the time the, like, the most poverty and health problems and so forth were also very, very strong spiritually and culturally. Um, and because the ceremonies were outlawed and were underground, they were like fresh from like contact on, shut down. So as they came out, they were just as they had been. And we began to see in this attic room, these, our children and Dorothy and myself, we would, we would see like spirit lights come in when the drumming and singing is going on and they would talk to us and tell us things. And you could, uh, the floors would heave and windows would open and shut on their own and the ceiling would even move and when animal spirits came and you could smell them and we thought well this is the way that it is it wasn't until we were around uh and in that time tribes didn't travel that much we couldn't it was even illegal to leave the reservation without bia approval bureau of indian affairs approval so in our generation we started going out reaching to each other, and then we found out that this didn't happen in a lot of people's ceremonies, that, that there was a disconnect. The spirits didn't come in like that. And what we got from that, which was the most important thing I think I ever learned in my life is, um, and our, our Sioux, our Lakota medicine man said this to us. He said, the power's not lost, you are. Mm. And around the same time, Elders told me, what's happening in this world can change. When, when the white man remembers again who he is, and we can sit together as equals and work out our differences. And my heart leapt because I said, oh, there's a way for the white man, half of me, to remember, right? But at the same time, with what we were in our spiritual awakening, what we were seeing and knowing and being just women and kids is that that power that we've lost it can come back it does come back and i want to say that to all of you listening who are of european descent black descent jewish descent whatever you are the power is not lost you are and that's great news because we can get that hookup with our whole minds with our indigenous selves, keep the Western side going linear too, but we can bring it together. And that's the way forward to heal. So what about this interface though? It's not just one magical moment. 
if I could say the magic word right now, Shazam, we all can think both ways and the earth is healed, right? So in the meanwhile, until we get to that moment, we have to think about how we bring these two ways of knowing. And um, uh, yes, D David Bohm was a good friend to both Leroy and myself. Uh, David Pete worked, helped me establish the indigenous, the worldwide indigenous science network. And we tried in various ways. Uh, we went out, we did conferences, we, we wrote books, publications, all sorts of things to bring the two together. But the biggest factor in these two ways, these two parts of our mind um, and peoples to come together has happened because of environmental catastrophe. And there are open-minded knowing people that are going to come together and work together because of the disaster that we face that I won't say transcend, but we'll work together even not having transcended or worked out our differences. Um, in, the, in the case of my own life's work in the Worldwide Indigenous Science Network, we consciously strive and conscientiously stri strive to create an ethical uh, interface between these ways of knowing because there's a big problem standing between us and that's the history of colonialism, of racism, of missionization. And that has to be faced. The shadow has to be faced. We need to not stay in it, but to confront it. And we need to have ways of doing it. Accordingly, we need a language, we need symbols, we need ceremony. So how can, how can we begin? Um, by way of searching my own uh, French ancestry, I ended up at Chartres, France. And I know my family genealogy on the French side back to the 1200s. So uh, one of my lines uh, comes uh, from right from the Champagne Valley, very close to Chartres. So I ended up there and the university, uh, Ubiquity University, uh, embarked on a uh, reenactment or perhaps inspired uh, liberal arts celebration and conference every year. So for 15 years, we've met at Chartres and we have celebrated one of the original seven liberal arts that were celebrated uh, at that site in ancient times. And before that, before that, this uh, Chartres was the Druidic Gaul center of the Celtic universe. Um, and the hill, <clears throat> it's basically a hill, an old volcanic hill, and it used to be covered with oak trees. And inside the hill is a cave with the two rocks, black and white limestone and basalt that come together and a spring. So every year the Gauls would meet there and the Druids would do their ceremonies. And that's where I ended up with no plan <laughs> and apparently no wherewithal to be there. So uh, what I didn't know, when I went out, when I got to, to Chartres, I went out to the hill at midnight and I was afraid because this is in the, we're in the medieval part of town and everything echoes off these stone walls and they're made of flint, golden flint. And I had brought a horn to bring with me to blow to the directions because my research had taught me that in ancient days and still in some towns in England, uh, there's a call to the directions each night. So I took my horn out and at midnight went to the top of the hill. I blew the horn and I called to my ancestors and I announced who I was quietly and explained that I, I was there to try to reconnect with them. And I apologize that we had forgotten them for so long. And I really cried. I asked, please, please forgive me, forgive my family and help us now to remember these ceremonies and these ways. What I didn't know, <laughs> what I didn't know is that two months before we arrived on the scene, uh, municipal workers had accidentally dug into a small cave at the top of the hill in front of the cathedral. And there they found a niche in the wall 
and there was a, a box and they took the box out and it had been there for 1500 years and inside the box was an intact, complete Gaul ritual set, the only one ever found. So from my indigenous point of view, I say the ancestors on scene are reenacting their ceremony and we, Apila, the university, were responding to that call without even knowing it. Out of that, in about seven years' time, uh, evolved a ceremony, a dream ceremony that's based on my Oneida dream work, but then it took a life of its own. So it's a communal, place-based dream ceremony. We do not analyze dreams. We come together in a circle, and we share our dreams, and we record our dreams in um, written form, and also we illustrate them. People are drawing. As we're, as we're, as dreams are being shared. And then this dream team gets together and we look at the glyphs because if you have at Chartra, we have up to 100 dreams in five days. And we need to, what we're looking for is, as David Bohm instructed us, the implicate order. What's the narrative that's emerging up out of the collective of these dreams? So we're, we were curating them, we're working with them, and at by Friday evening, and we've still collected dreams Friday morning, we do a presentation. We present a story back from what we have seen coming from, from this process. So why does that matter? It matters because for those of us who want to bring these two mindsets together, indigenous science, Western science, we lack a common set of symbols and language. And dreams are the unmediated communication from our uh, unconscious, if we, want to, if we want to think of it in psychological terms, from the ancestors, if I think about it in my indigenous way. Either way, dreams get past the watchdogs of our ego, and there's what they want to say. Um, We've witnessed healings happening there through this process and um, people dreaming each other's dreams, uh, giving, not even knowing each other. And um, in the time of the, we've also done pandemic dreaming now, virtual sessions, and it's, it's really worked well. So I did, I, I'm going to stop there because I could go on and on with the, with the dream work. But on the bottom line of all of this is we can remember, even though as people of European descent, whatever descent we are, it may have been a thousand years or more, the power is not lost. We were, and we want it back now. Thank you so much, Pila. What a wonderful, inspiring message. And I'm sure maybe some dreams to report tomorrow. But before we take any, any more questions, I just... I'd just like to ask Apila, um, because I know that there's some very interesting um, themes have been coming out of these shark dreams, uh, just to give us a, a little bit of an impression of the, the collective intelligence that seems to be emerging in order for us to remember in the way that she's been talking about and, and, and remember that we, it's we that are lost, not the power that is lost. So could you just maybe say a few words about that? And then we'll go on to some, some questions. I, can you say that? I'm not, I'm not tracking with you. Can you Yes, no, when, we, when we talked, you, you said that um, the, <laughs> there were some very interesting collective patterns and themes emerging from the dreams in the last few years. Um, you know, because we're all, we're all engaged with, you know, how do we navigate this multidimensional crisis? And, and we, we need wisdom from our deepest intuition, you know, in order to be moving in the, you know, together in the right direction. So I, I've had the impression that, that, that you had some, some interesting um, dream themes coming out in that respect. Is I, that correct? Uh, um, let me think how to get into this. I'm, I'm 
I live on the island of Maui. I'm married to a Hawaiian carver. He's a part of the Hawaiian Renaissance in the 1980s. Um, and this, this conversation we're having today is about being in one canoe. So uh, the Hawaiians have, the Polynesians are ocean going people. This is the biggest indigenous territory in the world, um, but it's mostly water. And that's, the Hawaiian Islands are also the most remote uh, land mass, as I said, in the world. And uh, so to be Polynesians, to be Hawaiian, you need a voyaging canoe. Uh, my husband helped recreate those in the 1970s, double hull voyaging canoe. Why am I saying this? Just imagine for a moment that you're looking at a globe of, the, of our planet. In the middle of the, the planet, the bulge of the planet, you have in the north, the Tropic of Cancer, the south, the Tropic of Cancer, Capricorn, and in the middle, the equator. The Polynesian peoples go north and south from the equator, about equal distance from Hawaii all the way down to New Zealand and Easter Island over here, and that's called the Polynesian Triangle. So um, when Polynesians sail, what they discovered in crossing the equator is this, that north of the equator, it's exactly opposite of south of the equator, and yet it's the same. For example, the seasons are opposite when you cross the equator. The water spins in different directions when you cross the equator. And when they made their canoes, there's two hulls, and, the two, and then the two hulls are connected by a platform called the pola. The hulls represent the polarities, male, female, whatever, however, but however you want to categorize it, it's the polemic. The platform or the pola is pola means refers to Venus. And Venus is morning star, evening star, disappearing, extremely complex. So what we get from that is a mindset um, that engages in like a dialectic and everyone knows it's the opposite and it's the same and there's a whole process of reconciliation here called ho ho'oponopono um, the, uh, the, that mindset typified in the canoe is what the dreams are helping us to do. We're bringing those two parts together through the dream. But the thing is about Venus, it isn't just factually morning star, evening star, darkness. It also describes the feeling of love, of compassion. And that's something that is sorely missing in our world and in our Western science today. So this is something that indigenous mind can offer and the dreams the dreams are like uh, the canoe sailing into our into our subconscious into the watery realm of our sleeping mind at night in the darkness of our skull right in comes the canoe okay. the thing about this is that when you consider that venus again what about that darkness um, to access the unseen, we have to go into it. And that, that darkness is also death. So you go in, but you can't commit to it or you're going to be dead, right? But when we go into it, psychology will tell us, and we, and we, we go into it to bring out the gold of our own awakening, of our own connectedness. And what we've seen now in the Chartres dream work and the virtual applications of the dream work is this. Um, through the dreams, dimensions start coming together in an uncanny way to help begin to restore our holism. Here's an example. Uh, recently, the dream team uh, of Chartres uh, had participated in a... Um, a conference, a Zoom conference on dancing with uncertainty. And the, 
the conference, partly organized by a colleague, Jürgen Kramer, who's a psychologist, acknowledges that to dance with the uncertainty that we deal with today, right now in this time of pandemic, is confronting trickster energy. And just to refresh your mind about the trickster, um, the trickster works through paradox, like the double hulls of the canoe, um, but the trickster is an energy. And it's an energy that through a dynamic interaction of complementary pairs of opposite puts a spin on everything. And normally with the trickster energy, the trickster can be a raven. It's typified in animal form as a coyote, as a raven. Um, and what it, it, it does terrible things for the wrong reasons, the greedy, selfishness, whatever. It does awful things, but it turns out good for humanity. Um, so in these, in these dreams, dancing with uncertainty, acknowledging the trickster, what came through? A fox. And there were three dreams of a fox. The first dream, the fox is rabid outside a person's door. And this man picks up, realizes he has to kill the fox because the fox is violent and aggressive, but he doesn't really want to. But he picks up the fox by the throat and he's shaking it. And the fox is beginning to die and he just, and he, he chucks it. He can't, he can't do it, right? And he knows he didn't kill it, but he's not sure really if the fox lived. The second dream report, and none of these dreamers knew each other. They're scattered around the world, right? Next person dreamt of a fox and the fox is uh, also looking kind of angry, but she realizes that it's afraid. And in her dream, she picks up this fox and she's lovingly holding it in her arms. The third dreamer, had, reporting a dream of a fox, says this, I live in Inverness. It's out in the country on the coast of California. Um, and she said, I was in reality, Sunday before last, I was sitting in my easy chair resting. And I guess she had the door open because up the stairs, came a fox and it walked into her living room, looked around and left. And she said, I'm sharing that because it wasn't a dream, but when I think of it, I, it felt, it feels like a dream. And I might not have believed it except my roommate saw it too. So in one series of dreams, these people don't know each other. They, there was no one living an indigenous life reporting these dreams. And yet look what happened. They acknowledge the trickster and bang, the trickster comes in, not even ambiguous, here's the fox. So the messages coming through the dreams the last five to 10 years have become ever more urgent and direct. At Chartres the last few years, we got verbal messages coming in dreams. You must act now, there's no more time can't be more clear than that, right? So in these dreams with, with the fox, you begin to see the dimensions coming together. And it comes in a way like that to show us, to have us experience through the dreams that we are one, that we are related. And then furthermore, through a longer process researching these the background of these dreams we find out a folk story in from Finland where the fox swishes its tail in cold snow like I mentioned in the beginning and through the swishing of the tail it goes up to the heavens and forms the aurora borealis right mm -hmm. well my part of that is while I was in Alberta still working with Leroy uh, one night I had to drive to the far north and it's a four or five hour drive right to where the tree line ends. I was very tired and I was speeding 80 miles an hour and no traffic on either side. So no danger that way. Beautiful black top road. And I'm barreling along and there's grass about 18 inches on either side of the road on the verge. And all of a sudden something caught my eye. The grass swished a little bit on the left, even as I'm speeding towards it and out and out slides a fox. And it stopped and it looked right at me. I hit the brakes because I'm afraid I'm going to hit the fox. I needn't have worried because as soon as I stopped, he slid back into the grass. 
I said, oh, I better stretch. Like, I could have, what if he did cross the road? You know, so I might have killed him. So I get out of the car and I'm stretching and I look up. Oh my God, the whole sky was just dancing green and blue and pink and yellow aurora borealis. If the fox didn't stop me, I would never have beheld mm. that, right? So how is that formed? The sun and the, the sun's solar ray, the sun's solar fires are coming into the Earth's atmosphere, hitting the magnetic surface of the Earth, and there you have the aurora. We human beings, we have a magnetic aspect to our selves too, but underdeveloped in the modern mind. Nevertheless, we still can have the dreams. That's our Aurora Borealis, right? And this fox came through the dreams to awaken that. So that's Thank an idea. That's about. A wonderful story. Uh, Leroy, what's, what's, your, what's your take on that and on dreams more generally? Very interesting stories. But generally speaking, it seems that the, uh, in the Western world, we limit ourselves to a state of awakeness. And this state of awakeness is where we draw all the boundaries. We draw all the boundaries. And whereas, whereas when you're sleeping, your mind doesn't go to sleep either. You know, it doesn't go to sleep. Your brains and intelligence and so on is still, is still working away. But the boundaries are not as pronounced. And our being is allowed to cross those boundaries. And when you cross those boundaries, that's where you get into the dream world. And you start to have the kind of experiences that Apila is talking about. See, But if we limit ourselves to this state of awakeness, we draw all these boundaries and we don't lie, allow ourselves to cross them. See? And so our experiences are very limited. And so even in science, see, Western scientists would never talk about, you know, using dreams in their scientific work. See? Whereas in native science, it's a dream is part of my actual experience because it's happening in me. It's happening through me, see? So it's an actual experience, see? And so my actual experiences, I can utilize for whatever, see? So those dreams are, is when boundaries are not as pronounced and we're allowed to cross. And consequently, we can draw new knowledge from, you know, the other side of the boundary, see? And that's where we draw, that's how we can draw knowledge from dreams. Yeah. Thank you. And so this also gives rise to synchronicity, um, which yeah. um, in, in, by implication um, you've been talking about, Pila. And I know that, Leroy, you've, you've had dialogues with Ian McGilchrist. Um, um, the wonderful right. in interview with, with you and he uh, on the side of a lake, uh, talking about <laughs> language and reality. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And yeah. We're, you know, he's very, Ian McGilchrist was very famous for left and right brain and the roles the left and the right play and so forth. And he says, with the left brain, we can talk about things and talk about, talk about them, but we never really know what they are. With the right it's kind of like art. 
the right side is we understand a deep and we embody things through the right side. We appreciate, you know, beauty and so on, but hard to talk about. Uh, uh, Dave, I just wanted to chime in here to add to what Leroy has said. The example of the Hawaiian canoes with the two hulls and the platform, uh, referring to Venus, that's really important because from Hawaii to the nearest, nearest land mass is 2,500 miles away. Um, it's, it, we are so remote. And the Polynesians had to sail over open water, 2,000 miles, right? The way that they can do that is knowing where they come from and when they put that, when that pro, when they get into the process of being on the pola and the two polarities still standing, but together, when their minds and their bodies are in that, like for example, when they really can't figure out sometimes which way the, is where they're going, they lie. Their whole body feels the motion of the water. They put their hands in the water. They watch to feel the temperature and the movement of the water, the birds, the kind of way all these things are, are going on. They have to be in this mind or they're going to die. They will not get to the next place. And, um, you know, this is like Western science really needs, like as a first step, we need to have some kind of reconciliation with indigenous people and say, you know what? We really messed up with, you, with your knowledge system and we're really sorry and we're not gonna do it again. Please forgive us. That's simple, right? What has happened in the past is they wrote in archeology span books and anthro books, Hawaiians just floundered and were blown by storms to settle the, the remote uh, Polynesian islands. Nothing could be farther from the truth. It's one of the greatest intellectual achievements of humankind, right? Hawaiians, including my husband, had to find out and remember how to build the ocean-going canoes and follow the chance and prove it, right? It took 30 years to do that. That's how that just destructive and diabolical Western science is, can be in its objectivities, okay? done. We see the whole earth is being destroyed right now because we're only using one part of our brain. How about we use both parts of our brain? And how about, even though sometimes they're opposite, we let it stand and come into a deeper order of wisdom, huh? How about that? We could do it. Indeed, indeed. Um, we have just had a, a message um, Hilary Mifflin, I was actually thinking about this, Hilary, about Kikuli and the benzene ring. You know, so sometimes there's scientific creativity coming through dreams. And, and, and I know that uh, Nikola Tesla used a lot of altered states in his, his creative achievements as well. Um, and then Tuvi Orbach has asked me, can you describe how you see and experience the other side and the relationship um, between what and how this is related to what the West calls external reality, and um, which of course is creating exactly the but the kind of boundary that Leroy has been uh, been talking about, and I shouldn't forget Barbara McClintock as well. Mm -hmm. so how do you see that, either of you? The, this division between this side and the other side. Maybe there is that's just an artificial division. I would say, um, in a way, this is kind of you know Leroy and I are covering male and female versions of indigenous science and knowledge. Um, so I'll say it from my point of view. Uh, here we say, because I'm in Hawaii, you know, if you have a moment where, um, how can I say, when we enter the darkness, where we go, according to where I am now, is called Uli, and it's a feminine spirit. It's, you could think of it as the womb. When you go there, it's, Uli also means like turning around. You go there, you come out of it. And when you come out of it, 
you're refreshed and you have ideas, maybe the benzene ring, right? But you never get to remember what happened to you inside of Uli. Mm. Mm. Thank because you. Because it's dark. <laughs> yes. Leroy, how, how, how's that for you? This, this other side, so-called, and then this is the boundary that you said that we create artificial boundaries. See, the problem, and I shouldn't call it a problem, but what happens is when you cross the boundaries and then come back, we try when we try to relate that it's like me speaking english okay and then i come over to the blackfoot world and i'm trying to explain what was happening over there all in english and i come across over here into the blackfoot world see and trying to do the translation starts to become very difficult, see. Well, the same with the notion of crossing boundaries. When you cross over there and have that experience and gain new knowledge, if you just come back with it, you know it you embody it and so on. But as soon as you start to try and explain it, you <laughs> run into the problems, see? And that's where, when Apila is talking about trying to bring Western and indigenous science, see, Western science is all about measurement. Indigenous science is about relationships. So if we can find a way to bring measurement and relationship together, we will open new science doors. Yes. Yes. I think that's, that, that's um, Brian Goodwin, who I imagine you both knew as well. I mean, he would say that this is bringing a science of quantities and a science of qualities together. Mm -hmm. And the Goethean science uh, based on experience and direct knowing was, a, was this science of, of qualities, which I think is closer to this seamless type of way of knowing that we've been talking about this evening. Uh, David, could I, um, could I mention the universe, the UP's work we're doing? Yes, sure. And then we'll okay. take Peter Hardwick, who's um, okay. been patient, patiently uh, waiting. Yes, sure. um, my life's purpose is, I said, for helping to develop this interface so we can come together consciously and ethically and figure out together how to work these two knowledge systems together. So... One of the things I'm happy to share with you is that after 30 years or so of starts and stops, we are just launching an indigenous science and peace studies master's and PhD at the, at the United Nations University for Peace in Costa Rica. And um, David and I, and uh, maybe Leroy too, we knew one of the founders, Robert Muller, quite well. And it's so beautiful late this late in life for all of us that we get to see the birth of this program, which is a place where people can come and study uh, just what we're talking about in this converse, in this conversation, how to bring the two together and ad advance the knowledge, deepen it, and hopefully have not only reconciliation, but a renewal of the earth, a renewal of our own souls, right? Indeed, so yeah, uh, it's wonderful, uh, and that's again. This there's, there's, there's a whole uh, agenda around um, peace, the development of peace, and the inner peace, and the outer peace. Is all of, all, yes. all of one of the aspects that we're dealing with. As of late, the past few years, we've been 
working on buffalo restoration because the buffalo is a keystone animal, not only because, you know, not only for the land, for the environment, but uh, culturally speaking, it's also a keystone animal. A large number of our songs, our stories, our ceremonies revolve around the buffalo. And uh, what the elders have said was, just like Apila was saying, the buffalo never left us. It was us that left the buffalo. And so we have to do the, we're the ones that need to come back. It's not the buffalo that has to come back. It's us that have yeah. to come back. And if you combine that with the notion of time, see in Western thought, time is a very important factor. Uh, it's an actual dimension, which it's not in Blackfoot, see. And so when, when we're talking about stories, narratives, as Apila was talking about, I can, you know, in, in Blackfoot, I can say, Unhook, meaning right now, the present. And that's all there is, is really the present. Unhook. But if I refer to the future, I would say, in other words, tomorrow. And I could say, Mr. Papinakosi, day after tomorrow. And I stopped there. And if I were to count backwards, I would say, Anuk Matune, yesterday, Mr. Putune, day before yesterday. And I stopped there. Not because I can't count beyond two. You know, in Blackfoot, I can count to infinity. You know, but as I say, there comes up, there comes as you say, what's the point? You know? Well, the thing is, but if you do the two-day thing, Mr. Papinakosi, two days, my ancestors and their stories, their experiences, their, all, their knowledge is always two days fresh in my mind. They're never, they never get old. See, so even if they never were told for a thousand years, mm -hmm. mm. they're only two mm -hmm. days old. Mm -hmm. That's how close my answers, my ancestors are to me. They're just two days away. Yeah. See? Very different approach and very different way of thinking about ancestors and closeness and so on. And therefore, the rituals are there, you know, that go with that knowledge. Yes, the same. I, mean, I love this that the, we never left the buffalo. <clears throat> no, the buffalo never left us. It's, and it's very encouraging that we can really, we're only two days away and a dimension away from remembering these things. Yes. Um, I'm just seeing in the chat here, there's a lot of interesting material coming up about foxes. You know, people are, are, are saying they have foxes coming into their gardens. There's, uh, there's uh, foxes in the allotment. And so this, this could be a theme to, uh, to keep going. Um, we'll have to... Oops, I'm, some things. Was, uh, so it, what I wanted to say is, if there's one message here, um, as you can feel the energy, even in this virtual circle, you can feel an excitement that's building. And one, when the two ways come together, guess what moves it? The trickster, the fox, right? Mm. And for those of you who are of English or European uh, descent and are living there, you have everything. You have your land, you have your animals, vestiges of your ancient languages your ancestors are only maybe one day away and 
time to remember these ceremonies because the earth can't heal until all of us have our medicine wheels active again and acknowledged again. So right now, in this moment, that little fox is swishing its tail and <laughs> things are going. And remember, it's the trickster. So we might not get to look good in what we say and do in the next few minutes, but changes afoot. Hmm. Well, I think uh, let's let's see. Um, people can send me or send a, a peeler uh, anything that happens with foxes in the next few weeks, and we'll we'll keep this conversation going. Um, I, I've this one interesting point that's been made here, um, uh, and which I think is slightly off the grid, but it's interesting. Um, Grant Jarvis talking about AI, um, and I'm not sure um, whether it can contribute to the relationship between tech and spirit if there were indigenous coders uh, who could help. But I, I wonder whether that's the that's a, a kind of mixing of metaphor and whether machine intelligence, how, you, how, how does machine intelligence relate to intuitive wisdom? Is there, is there a connection? I'm intrigued. Hmm. It depends probably how it's used. If it's used to penetrate indigenous wisdom, the wholeness of that, it's, it's more destruction. If somehow there's a conversation that can be developed with it, maybe. So the coding would in fact be the thing, but I, I have a feeling that this, were, that this is not the, the ballpark of development really. But I think we need to recover our own intuition rather than uh, farm it out to some machine intelligence. That would be my view. Uh, we'll take another couple of questions. We're and coming up. Can I can I yeah, jump you. in now Absolutely. with regard to AI? Uh, <clears throat> if you, you're looking at it strictly from a Western science point of view, uh, a lot of people uh, mix technology and science you know they use the two words in the same breath science is about discovering and a search for the unknown okay technology is application of the known okay so technology is always a little bit behind science, okay? Mm -hmm. So all our modern toys and so on, the actual science behind it probably was, you know, 100 years old, okay? And science is, I mean, technology is just now catching up and we think, hey, we're progressing and so on. Well, you know, the thing is, so from that point of view, if technology is application of the known, well, there's a human being behind it. See, there's a human being behind it. It's not dealing with the unknown. See, there's a human behind it. See. So, yes, there might come a time when we can use AI to delve into the unknown, but we haven't reached that stage yet. Yeah, very, very nice point. Very nice point. Um, something in interesting from the chat here, Helena talking about all in the same canoe and talking about sitting with patients moving through the dying process and about numinous dreams, crossing a great river in a canoe. And of course, the crossing of the sticks is something you find in Greek mythology. There's a crossing of a river, a crossing of a boundary is always symbolized um, in also in near death experiences. Um, just I, I'll just tell you what, what, how we're going to close, close this. Um, I'm actually going to read you a poem <clears throat> that I wrote <clears throat> last, <clears throat> last September called All in the Same Canoe. And yeah. then we're going to have um, a, a prayer um, to close um, and some thanks and gratitude for the time that we've spent together in this circle 
and uh, we'll blow the candle out. And <clears throat> then I will um, make a few brief announcements about what's coming up without going through a formal, formal process. I'll make it in narrative form um, in, um, in deference to, um, to our elders here. So I, this, uh, let me give you the context of this, this poem. Um, I was staying with Diana Clift in British Columbia <clears throat> and, and uh, I went to the I went to the museum and I I, I went to um, into the, the area that was that showed um, what life had been like um, you know 100 or 200 years ago, and I was moved and devastated by <clears throat> by what I saw, and um, because I saw the way that these these indigenous people had been destroyed, a language had been had been uh, obliterated, their uh, children had been uh, and brought up in a different culture, their identity had been shattered, you name it. I, I find it absolutely shattering um, experience. And a little bit earlier on, I had been into the Parliament building, which is a rather different experience. And uh, I, I read this phrase um, of an elder who was speaking at a meeting, and he said, we're all in the same canoe. And so this is my poem, uh, all in the same canoe, and I'll, we'll post it out. It's on my Facebook page, I put it up this um, today. Crafted from living trees in ancient forests, tended by countless generations, rooted in earth, connecting, caring, communing together, offering to share with open hearts paddling in the same canoe together. Then abruptly, felled, cleared, extracted, rooted out by grabbers, converting verbs into nouns, trees to lumber, minds to closed beliefs. So certain in intent, the rugged man paddles his own canoe alone striving so hard to win the race, tenacious to the last, he finally falters, nature exhausted. A daunting insight slowly dawns, we're all in the same canoe together. Mm -hmm. Which I think was the, that was the, the message of the evening. Well, it's been a very, very special um, evening for me, and I'm sure I'm speaking for all of us um, to have sat, as it were, in this virtual circle together with um, our dear elders, Leroy and Apila, um, speaking from their different time zones, their island, their mountain time, their traditions, their ceremonies, their sense of belonging, their sense of rootedness, a sense of being able to go beyond the boundaries and um, to move in and out of the light and the darkness and to bring these dimensions together. And I think that's been the feeling of this evening of, of, of becoming seamless again, of, of trying to, 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 to bring these different parts of ourselves together and to, to reach a point of healing, of forgiveness, of reconciliation, of renewal, of reconnection, of regeneration. All of these things that we know in our hearts are so necessary. And so I'd like to, on your behalf, to thank both of them for their time, their love, their insight, their wisdom, and this, this wonderful evening that we've spent together. And I'm going to hand over to Apila um, for a closing prayer. Flame burns bright, the love in our hearts. Lokahi, when the twin selves come together, oppositionally, complementarily, we dance, we sing, we rejoice in the unity that is our heritage. Through these sacred sites, through the mana, the power, the magic of that small little red fox wishing its tail, the mover of life, the crossroads, 
we look to you now and give thanks for how you've moved in our circle today and for all of the ancestors that joined us, spoke through us with each other, for all of the messages on the chats, all of the people sitting in the circle, each of us so alone in this pandemic and so intimate in this call. We ask for blessings for David Lorimer and acknowledge the long road he's traversed, the path he's been true to. May his life and may his work continue and be blessed. And for the community around the scientific and medical network, we give thanks. May each of us in this circle come away with a feeling of being seen, heard, and loved. If we have forgotten anything, ancestors, today in this call, or misspoken or misstepped, please, please fix that now. That we may do as my people say, we are of one mind and heart. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. One mind, one planet, one health. And that is actually the, the sort of light motif of our, our webinars um, for this year. And I think we've experienced that this evening. Um, and uh, thank you so much for these blessings and I, I send this light and love out to all of you um, who've been with us um, this evening. So uh, greetings and blessings from me and from Apila and from Leroy and everyone else on the call. And we will see each other very soon. Bye.